monsters. They exist among us, and sometimes they win. Even the devil was an angel once. The world has its own rules, and these rules are not human. Some of us seek answers to the origin and existence of cryptids and the unexplained. Join us as we venture beyond the known and accepted boundaries. Welcome to our nightmare. I think you're going to like it. Good evening and welcome to another episode of Phantoms and Monsters Radio where we explore the strange and the unexplained. I'm your host, Lon Stricker, and thanks for joining us. Uh, first off, if you enjoy our content, uh, then please subscribe and like and share our presentations. Uh, please feel free to place a comment as well. And uh, Super Chat is active during the show, so uh, please show your support for Phantoms and Monsters Radio by clicking the dollar icon under the chat. And um, we also, you can also support the channel by using the Buy Me A Coffee link. Uh, your consideration is very much needed and appreciated. So tonight, this episode of Phantoms Monsters Radio, we're going to present an obscure cryptid round table discussion. And uh, this should be interesting. Uh, we have Dean Bertram, PhD, who's a freelance writer, filmmaker, and film festival director based in Sydney, Australia. He is the co-founder of a Night of Horror International Film Festival. Dean has written for a range of publications, including the Australian, the Australian Financial Review, People Magazine, 3D World, and 14 Times. He founded a Night of Horror International Film Festival along with Lisa Mitchell and Grant Bertram in 2006. Bertram and Mitchell remain the festival's directors. Our friend Ron Murphy, the crypto guru, has been investigating the stuff of nightmares for over 30 years. He has delved deeply into the shadows to shed light on the things that go bump in the night and meticulously researched the historical and psychological context of myths and legend around the world. Ron seeks to uncover your archetypal precedent for the monsters that haunt our collective thoughts. And a witness to the living pterosaur, which I'm going to ask him about, author, illustrator, and biblical paranormal researcher Jason McLean has authored and illustrated numerous books, including How UFOs and Bigfoot Prove the Bible is True and Metroplex Monsters. He can be found weekly on SIRU Papers and Texas Front Porch channels on YouTube where he discusses cryptozoology, ufology, forbidden archaeology, and the paranormal. And of course, Bernadette McDaniel is an investigator and researcher of Phantoms of Monster Fortune Research, and she's joining us tonight as my co-host, and will soon be premiering her show, A Paranormal Life, on Phantoms of Monsters Radio. So guys and gals, thanks for joining me this evening. Thank you for thanks having for me. Having us. So, Jason... Yeah. Yes, Lon. I need you to tell us about your pterosaur encounter. <clears throat> no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I uh, yeah. So, okay. It was ninety two, uh, summer June. Uh, so you know, out of school, and uh, I grew up in Desoto, Texas. Basically, we are a suburb of Dallas. Our northern border is Dallas, the city of Dallas. So this is not the middle of nowhere. This is right off of I-35. And um, there is, you know, North Texas sits on a large, just flat limestone bed, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we have a lot of our uh, larger creeks and rivers. Uh, you, you see these white rocks, you know, because that's what happens. It's eroded all the way down into it. And the 10 Mile Creek, which is where this took place, is exactly that, right? It's about 30, it's 25, 30 feet deep in most places, and it's just sheer cliffs. There's a few places where the walls have sort of collapsed from, you know, runoff. Um, so you can get down into it. But by and large, it's very inaccessible. Uh, you, you, most people wouldn't even know that it was there unless you drove over it on a bridge, right? 
And because Texans are terrible at naming things, the reason it's called the 10 mile Creek is because it's 10 miles long. <laughs> Look, I, I admit Texans are great. A lot of things naming things <laughs> is not one of them, right? We got round rock, Texas, because there's, there was a big round rock in the river and that's how you knew it was safe to cross mesquite is named because is. Yeah. yeah exactly mesquite texas was named because it had a just a bunch of mesquite trees cedar hill was a hill with a lot of cedar trees on it we do a lot of things well naming things ain't one of them so we were there fishing it's about 10 30 11 a.m and you know we were, we were done and he's already up sort of that little you know i mentioned how everything would had cla- like the walls would collapse in that's how you get in and out so we were on this sort of artificial bank that the collapse had created well he's already up and he's through the tree line and i'm basically packed up and as i'm heading up and getting into the tree line i hear something and it's a it's a call it was very loud and i'd never heard anything like it before Mm. um again spent i spent all my time outside i know what this area was i know the animals in the area and so I poked my head out. I'm like, what the heck was that? People have asked me what it sounds like. The best thing I can come up with is it sounds like the caw of a crow, but ugly. Like, that's that's all I got. Um, mm-hmm. Close as I can come. <clears throat> so I just poked my head out from behind the tree line trying to figure out what's happening. And I see what I think at first is the largest blue heron I've ever seen in my life. Wingspan 8 to 10 feet across. And the reason I thought it was a blue heron, because, you know, it's about 10, 30, 11, so the, the light is coming down, so I can see it perfectly coming towards me. It was in the general shape of, you know, when a, when a uh, you know, heron or a crane flies, right? Mm-hmm. They do that shape with the wings, and they like to do that thing with their neck, where, the, you know, same thing with, like, like a pelican, where it makes that S-curve, mm-hmm. where they sort of take their long neck and bend it back, and they put their head on their shoulders, and why th- and sometimes they'll you know they'll fly with their legs out behind them. That's what I thought I was seeing. Plus, it was the color, it was the same color as a blue heron. It was Payne's gray, right? Mm. Sort of which is sort of a blue gray, if you don't know. Mm-hmm. And so I'm kind of elevated because I'm on the this, you know, the embankment's going up. It's a little low. And it isn't until it's right in front of me. Wing tip, its right wing tip is like five feet from my face. That I realize what I'm looking at has no feathers. And what I thought had been its legs sticking out behind it because it was a heron was actually a long flange tail because I just saw the legs. Uh, it, it it didn't look too dissimilar from what uh, from what Vince has up here except it doesn't it didn't have a crest and it had a long tail with a flange on the end. Mm-hmm. And so now that I've I've looked at it, I'm watching it go away. And so I get a again I'm I've got a good look at it. It just flies and just banks and disappears from my life. And long story short. I didn't tell anybody for 20 years because I didn't believe I'd seen it. The worst part of this story is like two years later, um, there was a show on uh, uh, like a a special done by NBC, um, like called the mysterious origins of man. It was the first time I saw, um, Oh, I just forgot his name. Uh, I'm terrible with names. Uh, Dean could probably name it for me. Uh, he, uh, you see him on uh, Ancient Aliens all the time. Uh, he does a lot of the, uh, exp- he, sort of, he sort of stays a lot of the large stone works. David Hatcher Childress, that's it. Oh, so that's David, a- okay. Yeah, so it's the first time I'd ever seen him, and I'm hearing these stories about pterosaurs in Texas, the Brownsville flap, all of that. And I'm mm-hmm. like, wow, couldn't have been what I saw, because that's San Antonio, that's the Rio Grande Valley, that's hundreds of miles away. Mm-hmm. And my basic assumption was there's no way there could be living pterosaurs in Dallas, Texas, and have nobody know about them. So I shut up. It gets worse. I had known Ken Gerhardt for years before I, I came out. The man who literally wrote the book on pterosaurs in Texas, and mm-hmm. I'm like, nope, not a thing. <laughs> yeah uh, so i mean it, it's it's terrible but i finally did you know long story short i came out and I, and I took some time off and i found there were a i was sort of right 
yeah, these things couldn't live in Texas and have no, in North Texas, very specifically in inside of the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, they have nobody know about them. Well, a lot of people know about them, mm-hmm. but like me, they were just way too afraid to talk about it. Um, what's worse is when I kind of came out, I had like three people known to me personally with these fantastic stories. One was about the goat man at White Rock Lake, but the other two were about pterosaurs in the area. Uh, after I sent the manuscript off, uh, the manuscript off from my book, uh, Metroplex Monsters, another person known very close to me, and per- he called me up terrified because he saw one. Mm-hmm. So the simple fact of the matter is people are seeing these things in and around the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, and I they seem to have a flight pattern. It's northern, it's northern Texas, uh, southern Oklahoma, out towards New Mexico, and you can literally trace their their flight pattern. I have uh, had people tell me that they think there's a flyway mm-hmm. from Central America up into Mexico up and up across um, New Mexico and uh, Texas. Now I don't know if that's true or not, but I've had a couple people tell me that. Yeah. Well, uh, I've got yeah, I've got accounts coming out of again southern te- uh, you know su- you know South Texas, the Mexican border. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I've got plenty of stuff coming up from. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean, in, in my question at this point is, it's not you know, are they real or not? I know they're real. I saw them, and there's it's that consistency. You know, the, the pterosaurs aren't sexy like Bigfoot. You know, meaning there's enough people who know about Bigfoot that you know they in the story gets you enough attention there's reasons for people to come and tell you that story and you can, yeah, you, you can tell when you're getting hosed. There isn't enough information out there about the pterosaurs. It's not as popular that, that it's that the, the field isn't really contaminated yet. Mm-hmm. So it's, there's, there's such consistency uh, where I'm at now is I'm questioning, do we have two different species or do we have one species at two different stages of development? That's the question where I'm at now, because there does yeah. seem to be much larger ones that are seen further south, and you know you can trace them, and you have the ones that I saw and the ones here in North Texas. My only question is, are they two separate species that's indigenous here, or is it one species that the juveniles stay in sort of like the creeks and West Texas, and then when they get bigger, they can go further distances, and so that's what we're seeing around the Rio Grande Valley. Mm. So that's sort of the question that we're at now. But yeah, well, so. you, you know, I we're actually looking at a, uh, a recent sighting out in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and um, I had just posted a couple, well, about a week ago, and uh, they the witnesses actually saw it twice. So and they were they were hearing it at night. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we do get a lot of sightings down in the Southwest, and especially in Texas. So, and people yeah. want to know the book. It was Big Bird. That was by Ken Garrett yeah. and uh, uh, Nick Redfern. That, that that yeah, that's kind of the first. There it is. Kind of the there first one that ever came out about this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Dean, welcome to the show. It's the first time having you on here. Well, uh, thank you for having me. Have you ever had an encounter or anything that's obscure? I mean, you know, I, I don't know if you've even had an encounter, but can you tell us anything about that? Or have you had an investigation with an obscure cryptid that uh, you'd like to talk about? I've never experienced a cryptid or seen a cryptid. I did, mm-hmm. when I was younger, have, which I've only started talking about recently, actually. I had a an ongoing series of either dreams or bedroom visitations, which, and this is before I'd been culturally contaminated by any type of, I suppose, extraterrestrial belief or the type of things you see on the X-Files or Close Encounters. But when I was little, and I'm guessing around five, that kind of age anyway, a little man used to come to my room at nights. Again, I'm, I'm not sure if it was a dream, if it was a reality, but it went on and on and on. And I mean, I can talk a little bit about that if you want to hear that, but sure. it's not really the crypto thing. Okay. It's, it's an interesting story. It's, um, he didn't look anything like a gray extraterrestrial. Memory's funny. That's something I'm very conscious of as somebody who studied mm-hmm. UFO abductions at an academic level. So mm-hmm. it's difficult when you talk about something you experienced 40 years ago to know how real that is and how contaminated it's been or not. But the fact that I've remembered it, I think, fairly clearly, throughout most of my life. And I've, I always remember this little man is looking goblin-esque. He didn't look like a gray, as I said at all. He looked almost, 
more like the type of little person you would see in an old movie like Freaks or an old movie like The mm -hmm. Wizard of Oz. He had that kind of, you know, compacted type look. Mm -hmm. He didn't, he wasn't like, a, he was, he had, I guess, what would be proportional dwarfism, or he looked like he had proportional dwarfism. All of his, his legs and limbs and everything weren't stunted, but he was very squat and compacted. If anything, he looked almost like that little goblin sitting on the chest of the woman in the famous nightmare painting with the horse's head in the background and the woman splayed backwards, which we tend to use as something representative of sleep paralysis. So everybody mm -hmm. kind knows what that looks like mm -hmm. now i'm sure i'd never seen that image when i was five um and i don't have very clear recollections of where he took me although i've always thought that the little man took me away and the only recollection i have of when i was actually taken somewhere is and again there's no memory of going from my bed dark bedroom to the light space i'm about to describe it was just there instantly and all of a sudden i was with the little man in a very, I suppose, large, wellish lit room, almost dome-like, I think. I remember ceilings seeming to be high anyway. And we were surrounded by very tall beings. And I think because I was a little kid, I was used to being surrounded by tall beings, in other words, adults. I assumed I was, I guess, at like, you know, an adult cocktail party or something like, and you pull on your parents' legs for attention. I know my daughter did that when she was around that age. She still does. And so I, for some reason, I thought the thing closest to me was my mother. And I remember very clearly thinking, oh, it's mom, you know, and tugging on its leg. And the thing bent down and its face was, you know, probably less than a foot from mine and it was not my mother and it was something that wasn't human and I don't like to describe that one because the memory isn't as clear because I only saw it once and I, I wonder how much what I can remember is a cultural contamination of horror movies and science fiction and the like but the thing didn't look human and it scared me badly and that's the only time I remember going anywhere with mm. where I actually went to the denouement of the story, which I'll tell very quickly, because I think in some ways it might be telling, it might be significant, is one night was the last time the little man ever came. I knew I knew if I went with the little man this night, he hadn't come yet, but I felt he was coming. I knew if I went, I would never, ever, ever come back. That's the painting. Thanks, Vincent. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I would never come back. And when he came, I can't ever remember before resisting him, but I actually fought him. And I didn't fight him like Rocky or I didn't box him or anything, but I have a very clear physical memory of tussling with him and physically resisting on the top of my bed. And it's very similar to other real memories I have of tussling with little kids in sand pits and playgrounds at the time. Little boys are always in fights. It's that, And that's the weird thing to me because I've always kind of dismissed it as something my psyche was maybe going through because I'm, I'm quite skeptical of a lot of these experiences, or at least I think I take, tend to take a, a sociological and psychological approach, although I do think the imaginal is worth looking at. But the fact that memory is such a real physical memory. Anyway, I resisted. I don't know if I won. I certainly came to some kind of impasse. The little man left, and he never came back again. And that was the end of this. It must have been you know months and months of visitations, or at least over not every night, but the, the thing went on for, for months of my life. I remember it being a big part of my sleep routine when I was little, being scared of this. Mm. Wow. Uh, Ron, your turn. Yeah. What can you tell us? I, I, I wish I had stories like this. Um, I unfortunately do not, uh, but I can try to look at the historical record uh, because the kind of uh, investigator that I am, I look like to see if somebody is having these kind of encounters, there obviously would be a precedent, correct? Like this just doesn't happen. And if these things are indeed happening to people now, let's see if we can find any kind of, like I said, any kind of antecedent about this in the historical record. And what Dean just described is very close uh, to the encounters that a person by the name of uh, Reverend uh, Kirk had uh, in Scotland uh, mm -hmm. in the late 1600s. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you are yeah. familiar with that at all, Dean. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, the idea that there is an underlying world, uh, you know, right up on top of ours, kind of layered on top of ours, and there's mm -hmm. a seepage through each, um, makes perfect sense whenever you talk about uh, the, the historical record. Uh, now, you said you're in Australia, correct? Uh, I was then. I'm in Wisconsin at the moment. Oh, Wisconsin. Right now. Oh, yeah. you're from yeah. Australia, right? I'm from Australia, but I'm based right. in Wisco now. Yeah. So you. Yeah, have, he's a cheesehead now. That's there. You go. That's <laughs> right. Uh, go Packers. So you have uh, the Wangina in, in in the Dreamtime narrative of many Aboriginal Australian uh, uh, cultures, uh, as well as the Mimas, the, these kind of creatures that exist in spaces between spaces, and they can interact with our world. 
Uh, but I write a lot about uh, the fairy realm, the idea of fairies and the idea of elementals. And what you described is almost, um, uh, well, not verbatim, but, but, but paraphrased almost the kind of experiences that uh, the Reverend Kirk had. Uh, whenever he was just going about his own business, he saw a, a light shining from the side of the hill when he entered it. And inside there were these very tall figures. Uh, and if you would look at the vernacular of the UFO culture today, you would describe this as, you know, encounters with the Nordics, you know, and the Greys, you know. Um, and I find that extremely fascinating that we have had this continual line of interactions with these types of creatures since the very dawn of humanity. So what are we supposed to do with this? I mean, it's not that people have been lying this entire time. And it's not, as you said, Dean, that this can be some sort of cultural uh, impression uh, on you, especially as a child. Uh, so as an investigator, the kind of research that I do, um, it's showing that you're keeping in some sort of uh, line with, with these kind of encounters. But but really, we need to get into, uh, down to say, where are these encounters coming from? And what are they for? Did you feel in any way as if you were gifted this? Or do you feel that it was almost an intrusion into your life? It felt like an intrusion, mm -hmm. when, certainly when I was little. And it's interesting you make the comparison to fairy lore, because as I've become older and obviously more interested in these type of topics, I've always thought this sounds, this seems to me more like it has something to do with what it's been called the other crowd or the fair folk or the mm -hmm. she than it does a modern extraterrestrial experience. So I think that's very, that's very insightful that that's the way that you interpreted it, because that's how I've, that's the kind of what I've lent to if there is a reality beyond my psyche, whatever, if I engage with something which was external, it seems to fit that pattern. I agree far better than an extra a standard extraterrestrial yeah. abduction pattern. And then the things that I have been researching, you know, I try to make these kind of connections. I try to, you know, connect the dots. And the more that you look into this, the more it seems that, and again, whenever you talk about fairies, it automatically goes to your mind of, you know, the Victorian impression of them, you know, uh, Tinkerbell and all that kind of stuff. But I'm talking about elementals, something that is part of this environment, mm -hmm. um, something that is um, intrinsically there, and also something that's very in intelligent, interactive as well, too. So the story that we also heard about the uh, the pterosaur, uh, you know, it, it describes perfectly as the Remphorhynchus, you know, that, that you know, play-by-play, yeah. play, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, but I investigated a uh, an encounter in Western Pennsylvania where somebody mm -hmm. was walking through the woods and he came upon two creatures tasseling, you know, kind of rustling. Same thing you described that was happening on your bed. Um, and he said this went on for a while. He couldn't remember if these creatures were wearing clothes or not because they looked as if they were part of the environment. Now, he called them brownies. But, you know, that was just something that was part of, you know, the, the, the in culture at that time, thinking about uh, Harry Potter. Um, but whenever we, he was saw, was, was saw them wrestling for a while, one of them noticed him and it vanished into the side of the hill. Now, he said that there was no hole into the side of the hill, it just vanished into the side of the hill. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, the other one, uh, very, very cool. The other one went through a series of shape shifts before it became, guess what, a giant bird and flew away. Mm -hmm. So as, as a researcher, you know, we, we talk about Bigfoot and we'll talk about all these other kind of things, but the idea that somehow glamour can be used, the idea that somehow these things can either project into your mind what they want you to see or yeah. somehow can change forms mm -hmm. uh, physically, I really think that's what's going on here. That doesn't make it any less real, mind you, right? People are still having these experiences. I believe you completely whenever you say these things. But, you know, it's very interesting to figure out where these experiences are coming from. If they're coming from, from deep inside of us, they're somehow projecting to us, or if it's a real physical interaction that's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, this is interesting because we did get a comment earlier when um, when Jace was talking about the pterodactyl. Um do you guys think these pterodactyl had mystical and paranormal abilities? I mean, I mean, if you want to bring the fey realm into this, mm -hmm. uh, do you think there may be a connection there? I, you know what? That's a question I've asked uh, a long time. I really don't have an answer to it. Um, you know, there's some connections to light to lights, right? Uh, the rope of Papua New Guinea is mm -hmm. said to be bioluminescent. Yeah. Um, I, I at this moment I still think that they are more 
that these are physical, natural existing creatures. However, that being said, to Rom's point, one of the th questions I've asked, uh, I just keep asking myself, is we do have, along with these pterosaurs, stories of these giant birds, right? Massive birds. One of the story, one of the stories in my book is about a lechusa, which is an owl the size of a human with a woman's face, right? Clearly not a natural creature, and, this, and the rest of the story is, makes it clear this is a supernatural being. But I keep wondering... You know, with Bigfoot, you can say, well, they die in the woods away from humans. We're just not going to see their bodies. But with some of these, with some of these, you know, Teratorn sized uh, condors that are described, mm -hmm. you would sort of imagine that somebody somewhere would have a four or five look, you know, foot long feather somewhere. And someone would have come across them. And one of the questions I'm really pondering is, again, how much of this stuff is paranormal? Or because I've got an account of, uh, from out of West Texas of this, them catching a giant owl. They said it was just a massive, massive owl where well, they locked it in the barn. They came back the next day and it was a naked woman. They said, okay, lady, you can just go. We don't want anything to do with this. <laughs> we don't know what the heck this is, but you may be on your way. Yeah. So, you know, for me, I ask that question all the time because Dean knows I'm 30 seconds on any given day from just saying, screw it. It's all paranormal. I'm out. I'm going to go draw Spider-Man or something because it's, you know, because it's the easiest way to just say, well, if it's paranormal, then you can't, ob we can't observe it objectively. So then, okay, then I'm out. I just need to know that it exists. Don't play with the fairies and I'm out. You know, I'm good. I'll, you know, I can move on with my life. Um, I'm not quite there yet because there's enough there that it looks like there is still a physical, re a natural reality, not just physical, but a natural reality to some cryptids um and the other stuff's clearly paranormal and i'm happy to you know you go do your paranormal things over there i don't want to you know mm -hmm. i i ain't getting no hitchhikers um mm -hmm. so yeah to the question could could what i ha have seen been something again along the lines of fey taking that form yeah i'd be an idiot to say no but when i look at uh, the consistency of appearance, situation, everyone says the same thing. It's They think it's a, a heron or a pelican. I got one owl one time, but it's only because it was at night. Mm -hmm. right? You don't expect herons to be flying around at night. Um, it's the consistency of description. I'm thinking, okay, this feels more like a real uh, tangible creature. But certainly that reality, until the body pops up, I can't rule that out. You know, until we can poke one with a stick, I'm, you know, I, I'd be an idiot to say that the that the fay or some sort of glamour isn't, you know, folding into this whole phenomena. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to bring up the idea as well, too, is the idea that they're, they're pernatural, you know, that these are creatures mm -hmm. within our world. We just simply don't understand them. You know, that's the mm -hmm. another real possibility. So when we talk about any kind of obscure cryptids, there's also that idea that these are simply natural animals that are beyond our sphere of knowledge because we've not put one down on the table and dissected it as of yet. Yeah. Well, you know, this also comes into uh, some of the questions that we have gotten with the Chicago winged humanoid sightings is, yeah. do these things allow certain people to see them? Mm -hmm. is, is, is the... Um, are they only perceived by certain folks? Mm -hmm. I think historically, we live in a in the modern world in modernity. We live with a different sense of what the cosmology that we exist in is. I think people a couple hundred years ago didn't have the same problem with demarcating between what's physically real and mm -hmm. what, uh, say, the fairies or paranormal or something else. There was an understanding there was a different a difference in the nature of these things that manifested or these things which we interacted with. But today we seem to be very obsessed with putting things in boxes. It's just part of that kind of post-modernity um, that we live in, or modernity, however you want to think of it. There's one, in interestingly, just while we're talking about the fairy and fairies and cryptids, there's a fascinating little tale I was going to bring up tonight, which kind of shows how it can fit both worlds. Traditionally in Ireland, 
and it also in most of the British Isles, people consider black dogs, big black dogs, to be paranormal. In Ireland, mm-hmm. particularly, they're thought of to yep. be to be part of the she. Maybe a fairy can manifest as anything, and it's manifested as a big black dog, like a puka kind of can be different things. But there's a fascinating story which Eddie Lenahan <laughs> tells of somebody he supposedly spent 150 hours or has 150 hours of tape recording interview with an old man in Ireland that he felt was a very confident and very assured and very rational witness. And that man told the story of a dog the size of a horse that was essentially terrorizing an Irish bridge at night so that people couldn't go over the bridge. And eventually one thing led to another and supposedly the dog was confronted by the priest and the dog died or was killed. Anyway, up to that point, it sounds like it's just part of a standard fairy tale. Mm-hmm. But supposedly the body of that thing was found in the the creek or the stream which flowed out to the nearby coast. And people from miles and miles away came to look at this dog-sized horse until and they didn't want to touch it. And eventually it was just washed out to sea. So that gives another sense perhaps of normally we would we'd have to demarcate between that. Is it is it fairy? Is it real? Maybe, maybe when things become physical, they can stay physical. I mean, these are yeah. things, it's all speculation, of course, but we tend to we tend to force ourselves to think within certain modes. And I think sometimes that's a real problem going forward, looking at any of this kind of stuff. Yeah, the well, J- the story that Jason brought up earlier too about the owl that transformed into a woman. You know, if we were in the Orkney Islands and talked about, you know, uh, the uh, uh, you know the, the seal people, if you will, you know, yeah, if we talked about that kind of stuff. Um, then that it's following the same suit. It's it's that same idea that they are some sort of supernatural entity. But whenever they they re, they take that they take that off, you know, whenever they remove that kind of glamour, then they enter a physicality that where they can actually interact with us and somehow even be under our control at that point as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We got a question from Eric. He wants he and he asked, "Pukas are a reality." Well, I mean, I. Th- I th- I tend to think that it's as as real as anything else in the paranormal yeah, field. I, I agree mean, with that. Yeah. Any, I, I grew up on Harvey as well, so I was pre I was preconditioned <laughs> to to believe yeah, really, in, in okay. pukas. Yeah. No, I, I want to. Uh, uh, this this is a quite a fascinating thing too. If you go up to the Bridgewater Triangle, the creatures up there is the puck wedgie, which is very similar sounding. Yeah. Uh, whenever it comes to that, and it's it's separated by time and space, uh, so you know it's it, it that's a Wampanoag uh, language, you know. So that's something that the uh, the Native Americans in that in the uh, in that area call them. But wouldn't it be fascinating if this is the the, the name that these creatures go by, and it just kind of get passed on in different languages around the world again and again? But we're coming close to the word of Puka, you know, the idea of like Puka mm-hmm. the Pukwudgie. That's that comes down to uh, their actual names. Yeah. You know, I saw the movie. Did did, did James Stewart ever call it a puka? Yeah, he call, movie? yeah, he oh, calls yeah. it a puka. Yeah, he calls it a puka in the movie. Oh, oh I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jeez, that's been a long time. I it's forgot my, about that entirely. It's, it's one of my daughter's favorites now too, because I introduced her to it recently. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've, had, I've seen that since I was a kid. I was about to say. Yeah. I, but it's, I think I'm on 30 years for that one. I don't want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, going gotta, back to these things. Yeah, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Lon. Go ahead, no, going no back to go these ahead. things, how they, you know, pick certain people to see them. That mm-hmm. brings back a memory that I had. Like my, I lived in this house on Laurel Mountain. I'm sure Laura, Lon and Ronald, you guys are familiar with Laurel Mountain. And there was a shadow man in that house. And I was the only one seeing things. My grandmother, my mom didn't. My mom had her two friends over and they came in my room. And my mom's like, they were talking and she's like, she thinks it's haunted. There's a man in here. And I looked at them and I said, there is a man in here. And I had my window open. Laurel Mountain, there's nobody there. People from Pittsburgh come up for the summer, maybe the winter if you're lucky. But otherwise, if you live there, you're around, you're basically by yourself. And they're like, there's no ghost here. There's there's nothing. She's like 10 you know, there was a man laughing right outside the window, clear as day. They went to the window. They looked out. It was like a one, you know, there was, there was a one story house. They looked, there was nobody there. The look on their face, they never came back. They never talked to my mom again. And my mom was like, what, what was that? I'm like, I told you there was somebody here. 
you know, and you could have heard them run because it was woods. You could hear somebody run off. Yeah. If somebody was there, you know, being yeah. a jerk and trying to. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was. You you have to wonder. Yeah. You know, the uncanny, I was seeing... yeah. The yeah. uncanny <laughs> element in this whole story, Bernadette, is the tell that I told about the man uh, experiencing those two things he thought were brownies is about ten miles away from where you're at. Really? Laurel Mountain. Yep. Oh, wow. We know something about Laurel Mountain. We've gotten yeah. some weird wow. pictures yeah. from Laurel Mountain over the years. Yeah. yeah, it was right over there on the Chestnut Ridge. So Laurel Mountain, you were probably up there. You're quite near like um, Wind Run and things like that. Is that yeah. where you would have been? Yeah, so yeah, we're, we're talking about yeah, maybe even less than 10 miles where that other incident took place. Wow. Yeah. That, yeah, because we, yeah. we lived in two different houses on that mountain. In each house, there was something. Yes. So, gentlemen, yeah. let me ask you another question here real quick, because, uh, and Jason, you did a great deal of explanation concerning the geography in which your yeah. uh, uh, situation took place. And, and now, Deed, so is it possible these creatures can be manifested from the, the earth itself, geographically, geologically? Is there something going on in your particular parts of the world that it allows these kind of manifestations to take place? Because in our area, we're very rich in limestone and granite, and it seems as if the earth yeah. itself is able to manifest these things. So that's actually a that's something I've really, really thought about um, for several reasons. One, we do a lot of research out of Brown Springs. Mm -hmm. And again, Brown Spring, there is a spring on go. the limestone. Again, where mm -hmm. I was, limestone. And I have several accounts coming out of the not just of the pterosaurs, but of Bigfoot being seen in and around the 10 mile creek using the 10 mile creek and now i'm starting to get dogman mm. stories out of it so don't don't get me wrong that absolutely flipped every alarm bell in my head on that because it's like you know what's the uh what's the murphy's law of combat once is a once is an accident twice is a is a uh uh not convenience Oh, I cannot talk tonight. <laughs> this, I, I I haven't gotten a lot of sleep lately. Uh, dang it! Of course, now it's only because I'm on a, I'm on air. But third time is enemy action, right? And it's like you could chalk up the Bigfoot thing because they we know they use rivers and creeks, right? Like there's an explanation to some of it, but to have all these things sort of happening in the same place, it does beg that question: Is there something? Uh, again, is this? all different phenomena happening for different reasons or is it all one phenomena manifesting in different ways i don't have a good answer for you like i like i said earlier i'm 30 seconds away on any day from just saying nope it's all paranormal i'm out right right, um, right. It's, yeah it's interesting go ahead i'm sorry no, I was just going to say where where I grew up in Sydney. I'm not sure what the limestone content was, but I know we were on bedrock. You couldn't dig mm -hmm. more than you know six inches into the ground and hit solid rock on the house mm -hmm. where I was. But but of course, stone tape theory plays an awful lot in paranormal investigations and paranormal and ideas of ghost manifestations as well. And I think that's why it's worth, as you're suggesting, mm -hmm. Ronald, to look at these potentials as well. Because if we can, if there is some kind of link between manifestations of Bigfoot or manifestations of fair folk or manifestations of pterosaur as well as manifestations of what people are taking to be the dead then we we come closer to a, a type of holistic mm -hmm. approach which is what something which i think this field needs because i think an awful lot of these things are interconnected which people tend to you know ghetto off into their own little areas I, I agree 100 percent uh one thing that we're missing in the united states and probably missing in the australian continent as well too is that great british tradition that european tradition of ley lines you know these ideas mm -hmm. these power points yeah. uh and if you would go to certain areas where these ley lines are supposed to have this outpouring of uh, of energies you'll see pagan sites were built there and on top of those sites there were you know roman catholic churches built we don't have that in america but what we do have is things that were left over by the aboriginal peoples in this area such as the mound builders and what we find yep. in, in a startling relations to the mound builders is dogman encounters as if they were the manifestations of this area as well too um and what is odd about the dogman is that you know it's often you, you would think that it's not it deals with funerary aspects it deals with the, the abode of the dead and if we take our little pencil and we start connecting the dots we can go right over to egypt and see anubis carrying on the exact same tradition so there's something about this idea why different cultures through like i said through time and space 
connect these certain creatures with different areas. So if we're talking about cryptids, mm -hmm. then we're also talking about something based within our psychology as well, too, because we are attaching them. Unless they're attaching themselves to it, we are attaching them to certain areas. You know, and that is truly remarkable as well, too. Even if they're not flesh and blood animals, even if they are simply figments of our imagination, let us say, let us just play the devil's advocate there for a second. Then what we're saying is over the past 5,000 years, different cultures are, are looking at their environment and they're creating these dog man creatures and making them have similar, um, you know, occupations with those environments. That's crazy to think. Let me, let me help you out with that. Cause that's actually something we've been dealing with as well over on, on our channel. And uh, so I 35 right on a ley line. Brown Springs is at an intersection of the ley line. And of course, Brown Springs oh. is a is an, a burial mound. In fact, when the first time I was there, I looked over, I'm like, this is a burial mound. I know what I'm looking at. There's don't want to get off off on that, but yeah, I know what I'm looking at when I'm talking about an, a burial mound. So it's one of those things where, to your point, these things all interconnect. I saw uh, so real quick, uh, Purple Hobbit, Michigan. I got several stories of pterosaurs out of Michigan. I I, I would argue the the original sighting of the Jersey Devil is a pterosaur. Uh, so yeah, I mean, they go anywhere. Charlemagne, the God talked about seeing them in Georgia and I've got a lot of accounts out of Georgia. These things are everywhere, but to your point, I think this is where, you, you know, it's like, we don't have answers. What we have are a lot of really interesting things that we do need to, to Dean's point, take a holistic look on. We need to be willing to ask the questions like, what if none of this is physical and, or rather, what if it's not all natural, but there does seem to be evidence that some of this is, you know, they're natural animals. Some of them are not. We need to, we need to, I think, go backwards a little bit and take things out of the boxes Dean was talking about, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I like my Amazon box. I get to put things in. But sometimes you gotta bust it out and let them and let them fly. Bernadette's <laughs> awfully quiet. I, I want to hear from her though. <laughs> Did you ever beat um, up a, a dog well, man? I have not. So Lon had actually given uh, my boyfriend and I a case to go out near Wilmore and we had found tracks and while he, my boyfriend, he's an avid hunter. So he was looking at the tracks and he's like, this isn't a bear. This isn't, he's like literally talking to himself and I'm just like, well, I don't know what it is. It, it's mm -hmm. huge. I've never seen anything like it. This is your area, not mine. And I hear noise to the left of me because we were near a Creek and everything. And then I hear like flapping and I go to turn and it's like, so, you know how when somebody rushes up on you and you yeah. can feel like that person's yeah. going to rush up on you and grab you. I had that feeling and I turned and I just screamed because whatever it was, was on, you know, going to be on top of me. And there was nothing like mm -hmm. I heard the footsteps after the flapping and there was nothing. And I like, he's like, what are you screaming for? And I'm like, you didn't hear that. You didn't hear any of that. He's like, no. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, you know, I'm like, I know what I heard. And it was just dead quiet. There was no bugs. There was no mm -hmm. birds. Nothing. It was just yeah. dead the entire time. Yeah, it's interesting. He went that... back. Sorry. No, you go, Bernadette. I'm sorry. I thought you no, I didn't mean to cut in. No, I was just going to say it's interesting yeah. that. He, um... he went back. He went back. <laughs> yeah, he went back and he said. It was, it was totally different. He said there were birds, there were bugs. Mm -hmm. He said it was like a totally different place when he went back to check and they had found another footprint. So oh. he's going to go out there now and check right, you know, during, mm -hmm. right before hunting season. Go ahead. You were going to say something. I, I was just going to say, it's interesting that, um, that Vincent pulled up the hide behind picture, which, yeah. which I'd sent through because I wanted to mention the hide behind and your, mm -hmm. your case sounds not that, not unlike that hide behind story. We tend to, or those hide behind stories, we tend to think of a lot of the type of weird critter stories, which were published in books like Fearsome Creatures mm -hmm. of the Lumber Woods by Cox and uh, Tyrant's Fearsome Critters. And recently, of course, the wonderful Chad Lewis's lumberjack creatures of the north woods that a lot of those were just tall tales told by you know lumberjacks out you know doing their stuff to scare the 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 new recruits but one can't help but wonder because there's several there's not there's a lot of them which are clearly tall tales but things like the hide behind seem to be 
at least at, to a degree, an on-point description of not, if not the entity itself, the experience of people feeling something yes. near them that they can't see, and or and people people disappearing. You can't help but think about the report by Bruce Maccabee's wife, which is which David Polites covers in Missing Four One One: The Hunted, when she sees like this predator type thing out in the woods. You know, this yeah. thing with this invisible mm -hmm. type predator shield. One wonders if those type of experiences. If somebody had 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 experienced something like that a hundred, two hundred years ago, how would you have described that? Something that was so thin it could hide behind trees, maybe, or something mm -hmm. that you couldn't see. So, the hide behind like a, a number of other stories from those those lumberjack and fearsome critter books, like the whirling wimpus, which was meant to it's all, it's before Bigfoot's even talked about. It's a Bigfoot type creature. It is an ape like mm -hmm. creature that supposedly waits at a bend on the trail and then spins around so fast you can't see it and you're disappeared. And all you can hear is this weird droning sound. Again, like the type of things Polites yeah. talks about in Missing 411. So you have to wonder, again, these things come down to us as tall, tall tales, but there are there are things which we recognize as people interested in this this type of phenomena or these type of phenomena now. We recognize Bigfoot type creatures. We recognize things that people hear behind them and they can't, you know, identify what it is. And we were attaching these type of entities to weird disappearances in the woods. One other one quickly, and then we can you guys can talk about it or we can leave it behind, is the agropelter. The agropelter yeah. is a monkey-like creature which supposedly threw you know, wood and other things that people out there in, in the North Woods. And mm -hmm. obviously it brings to mind, of course, that Sasquatches are meant to throw things at people, but also there's a long tradition of devil monkeys throughout all of North America, in Alaska, yeah. through Canada, down all the way into Arizona. Everywhere has these stories of things which don't seem to be Bigfoot. They often have tales and the Native Americans often talked about fighting and killing these things. Hammerson yeah. Peters writes about it, I think, in his mystery mm -hmm. is it is it alaskan mysteries or mystery mystery mysteries of alaska's most recent volume three I, I i always dig his stuff but he talks about native tribes having legends of having to flush these things out and kill them and they didn't call them monkeys because they didn't know what a monkey was but they were yeah. small man-like beings with tails and covered with with fur and today people still mm -hmm. have these kind of encounters so when you look at those old weird lumberjack legends you wonder how much of it was based on something and you didn't mm -hmm. have fox or cnn or phantoms and monsters to report it to it just went around you know it just went around the campfire and got weirder and weirder but these these people were out in the woods where no, you know where no white man had ever had ever trod before lord yeah. knows what they were experiencing yeah. back then yeah on the agripelter i'm actually a, a big fan of the idea that that may those may have just been encounters with uh juvenile bigfoot but to the point you do have the, the rest of these stories of these devil monkeys going all the way up to Alaska. None of it makes sense from our view, right? The sort of the modern view. But to Bernadette's point, your story... <clears throat> hold on, I have a whole shtick for this. In okay. my book, Metroplex Monsters, Dallas Demons, Fort Worth Goatmen, and Other Terrors of the Trinity River, available wherever fine books and trashy rags are sold. Um, the the story that I told you, or, or that I mentioned earlier about the, the, uh, the Lachusa... Your story is very, very similar to that. And the fact that this thing was clearly physical. It was bouncing around on trees, <clears throat> right? Terrorizing her, this young lady and her friend. So much so mm -hmm. that her friend her friend looked at her and said, look, your aunt's the witch. This thing's coming from you. I'm out and runs. And so mm -hmm. this thing was literally bending the trees and she was running up to, her, to get into the house her aunt opens the door and she says she screams at her at her at her niece, the the eyewitness, don't turn around, don't look back, right? Because she's uh, she was a Kurandara for Oak Cliff, and of course, the eyewitness says, you know, like a dumbass, I turned around and saw this thing. This bird had bird with the human face. The tree was bending over. This thing was clearly a physical creature. It had weight. It was affecting the world around it. It was bending things over. It was tapping on her window. But it followed her for the rest of the week. And she'd hear the... And, and she'd hear the flapping of wings when she was in a movie theater in the West End. Like, it's clearly not a material creature. And, it's, and she was the only one hearing it when it was... When she was in the movie theater, when she was somewhere else, she was the only one who could hear the tapping of the wings. But for that moment when it was physical, her friend heard it and terrified her and scared her off. Her aunt saw it. She started throwing charms and oils and holy water, probably a tamale at it. Like, 
<laughs> it was, you know, and she was swearing and praying in Spanish at the same time. Like it was like, yeah. this was a real physical thing that impacted the world. And yet it is very, very clearly paranormal. Yeah. And when it was paranormal, she was the only one who could see it and, or who could perceive it being in their, in the area. So, I mean, Bernadette, to your point, I, that's, that story sounds very, very familiar, right? It sounds like, the, I mean, there, again, this is a holistically connected phenomena that perhaps appears in different forms, depending on location or beliefs or who knows yeah. whatever. Hmm. And you know, it's very strange that you say, oh, sorry, Lon. Go ahead. It's very strange you say that, Jason, because when we had talked to the witness afterwards, you know, we just had randomly said, you know, mm -hmm. have you had any other encounters besides this, you know, anything in the family? And he got very quiet and he's like, I kind of said to my dad offhandedly what happened. And I, he's like, I thought my dad was going to tell me I was crazy. And he looked, he said, my dad looked at me and he said, no, you're not because I've had an encounter just down the road with a winged humanoid. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't call it a winged humanoid, but yeah. he said, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And like my boyfriend, we were both shocked. So, I mean, maybe, maybe it's appearing, whatever it is, like you said, you yeah. know, to different people. Oh, I've got three different accounts in an over two month period of a gargoyle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really is one yeah. of those things where you're like, okay, people are seeing these things and they've clearly seen them since the dawn of time. The Lachusa right. is just, I would argue the same is it's, it's the same thing as the, as the Greek harpy. It's the same thing as, uh, you know, you can see the, the, the overlap with uh, uh, Lilith from the Hebrew, like in, in the Sumerians. This stuff goes all the way back. And we're just, to Dean's point, maybe the bigger problem is that us in our modernity, our view of, of things, maybe it's our, that's our problem, is that we're creating a box. And if it doesn't fit, we'd want to ignore it instead of recognizing there are things that don't fit in our box. Right. Mm, I do like that. I do like that. I, because um, that, that is a good way for uh, science to... Uh, step out of this because the conversation we're having right now could be carried on in an academic setting there's no reason why it couldn't be because we're discussing folklore we're discussing you know uh the, the way that the earth can manifest uh certain situations and such but science doesn't like to look at this kind of stuff because they can hold it down correct i mean it doesn't make any sense to them but i i do think that that is what's going on i, I think that all these things have a, a there's something rationally irrational about all this stuff, if that makes any sense. Yeah. No, it does. Well, it, it, so this is the thing I've, I, again, I don't want to get too far off on the subject, but this is one of the bigger, bigger problems. Uh, one of the things I, I talk about is like, we don't have the Spookatron 5000 that we can actually observe objectively paranormal phenomena. If you go back 500 years before the invention of the microscope and you told somebody the reason they got sick was because there were tiny animals so small that they that they were invisible to the eye. They look at you like you were crazy. The best scientists at the time would say you're a crazy person, right? The problem is modern the modern academia doesn't like this stuff because they have a very they have a very specific worldview, and that worldview is what is is what is taught, right? They, uh, there is, you know, I, I like to argue it's not that there's no, the fight isn't between science and religion. It's between religion and religion. We have a, we have a, we have a, a naturalist Darwinian atheistic perspective of the universe that is officially taught And anything that falls outside that box has to be cut off because it quite, it brings that entire box, the nice little Amazon box. Everyone's got it in. It calls that whole box into question. So these, these sightings, these encounters, because they're outside of that box, they don't want them because the their very existence calls to question the validity of the box that they've put everything in. Well, I think we have to remember, because most of us probably like to consider ourselves Fortians of one type or another, mm -hmm. that the great granddaddy of all of this, Charles Fort, despite him perhaps best being recognized as somebody who collected and collated anomalous you know, tales, what his main gist was is that science was incapable 
of handling any of these things and why he yeah. picked them is because he liked to have a jab at science because mm. science as Thomas Kuhn, the famous philosopher, philosopher of science would say almost 50 years after Tom, after Charles Ford had already said it, science works in paradigms. It, it isn't something that we all imagine when we're little and we're taught through grade school. And even if we do the sciences in university, that science grows, you know, with one person in finding something and then somebody stands on his shoulders and then somebody stands on her shoulders and so on and so on and so mm -hmm. on. And we get closer to reality. A, a paradigm becomes popular because it's popular it becomes dominant because the popular scientists the popular kids in the establishment yep. get on board and anybody else who wants to work in the establishment follows suit and then the rest of the science is done within that paradigm it's mop-up work people working mm. inside the paradigm to make the facts fit the paradigm now eventually that paradigm can and does collapse but the new paradigm that replaces it isn't necessarily any closer to reality than the previous paradigm or any yeah. better or any truer. It just explains the cracks a little better. And that one comes about by a conversionary experience. It becomes popular. And so people are converted to jump on the new paradigm. So my problem with science period is we can't talk about science without talking about the human element of science, right? And any human endeavor is sociological. It's always contaminated by biases and by the desire to be on top or the desire to be liked or the desire to be popular or the desire to get your, you know, to get your foot in the door or to stay on top or whatever. So I can't see science dealing with a lot of these things ever. I'm like Charles Fort still. I don't think we've come any closer since Fort wrote, you know, Book of the Damned and so on. And I don't think we're going to get any closer with the scientific model. I just don't. That's my terribly pessimistic science position. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me ask this. Um, you were speaking about Bruce McAvee and his wife, his wife in particular, seeing the uh, the glimmer man effect, or yeah. what people, some people used to call it glass scene. Uh, do you think that is? Uh, do you think it's a cloaking? Something they use to cloak these beings, or whatever used to cloak. Or, or do you think it's something else? I mean, you know, it's interesting. I have been looking into this um, this flying manta ray phenomenon now for mm -hmm. about a dozen years. Yeah. And uh, I have had at least two sightings uh, where people have even mentioned this glassine effect with them. Now, of course, we hear people talking about uh, – well, maybe Bigfoot is, or other cryptids are using it as some type of uh, some type of cloaking. Uh, you know, I think the guy who did the Predator movies must have had an encounter sometime down his, in his life of something. I mean, it, it, it's pretty astounding how many people since that movie has was actually released and still coming out have seen these these glassine type beings. I wonder if it's not so much a cloaking de device as it is us seeing something which isn't fully formed or it deciding well, not, to, not to show itself to us. The way that Ronald before was talking about fairy glamour and the like. I mean, it's mm -hmm. very hard for us to say what any of these things are, but if they come and go, and I tend to think that they do tend to to come here, whatever that means, and have some physical impact, but then they don't leave any lasting bodies or ashtrays from ufo crashes that we ever find or you know anything which is ever scientifically analyzable or is ever fi the final word so i wonder if when we see those images or we see those flashes if it's just it in its more natural form maybe or it coming between somehow or it hasn't put on what it wants to show us yet i mean that's just a total speculation but i think all of this stuff's just speculation well it clearly is but what if and let's Let's continue down the speculation since we're not going to talk about the. I really want to talk about the Cadborosaurus because I like my eggs. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, what if? So let's let's take this one step further to Ron and your points. What if the reason we see this predator effect is because of the movie Predator? It has given us something to see sure. because where this is where the this is where that that sort of realm because particularly for the paranormal becomes. Again, what's the what is the difference between a tulpa and a being that already exists taking that form, right? Because it's our popular belief or our popular thoughts. What if it simply allows <clears throat> that idea allows us to actually perceive it in that form? So it's both a thought form and a separate entity all at the same time. Maybe a lot of these things don't actually have natural forms in the way we would understand them. 
And so our our assumptions about the universe, our cultural context is what a lot is what gives these things form of a type. So maybe the reason we're seeing the pre this predator glimmer is because the predator movie exists. And so that's in someone's head now. Absolutely. I mean, it could be a thought form. I mean, we, you know, this whole subject of thought form comes up a lot of times. I mean, even with, um, well, basically with uh, poltergeist, but you know, mm -hmm. that's basically a thought form. And then, you know, of course, in the cryptid world, we, we hear about it all the time. Mm -hmm. You you uh, mentioned Jeepers Creepers type beings in one yeah. of your winged humanoid yeah. books. And yeah. After that film, people were seeing Jeepers Creepers creatures. Yeah. You know what? I, I, I would say that 30% of the sightings of these winged beings in Chicago have been described mm -hmm. as either gargoyle or the Jeepers Creepers yeah. creature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, pe you know, people do make references to what they know. Uh, you know, that doesn't surprise me, but it's mm -hmm. interesting how their perception of it closely details what, you know, what the, uh, you know, of a, of a animated or fictional character would look like. Well, I think if you give something enough energy, you'll bring it to life. Well, that may be true. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. but, like, and, I hope the kids are in bed, but like Santa Claus, I can give you that Santa Claus. What's your, I what mean, are you saying about Santa Claus? Yeah. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what are you, you trying know. to get at Bernadette? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this. And this actually happened. So there was a year, my mother told me something about Santa Claus and I kind of told her, no, you're lying. It's not true. You know, you'll see. So that night I went to bed and this was this was on Laurel Mountain, and from where Jennerstown is, you could hear sleigh bells in the distance, and they kept getting louder and louder and louder. And I shot up. I ran in her room, and I'm like, "Do you hear this?" She slept with the TV on, and she's like, "What?" I'm like, "I shut the TV off." She got very mad, and I'm like, "Listen," and she just the color drained from her face. Because, I mean, they were right over the house. And she was just, the look on her face was mm -hmm. just, I'm like, let's go outside. It's him. She's like, you're not leaving the house. I don't know what that is, but you're not leaving this house. And, I mean, it was so loud. And it just, it passed over, like, going towards Greensburg. Wow. And so, yeah, I had I had actually told my boyfriend, I'm like, he's going to think I'm crazy. He looked at me. He said, no, I heard them, too. Mm. He said, they yeah, were. Nothing on the Chestnut Ridge yeah. surprises me. I mean, I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, I've heard and so I many was, crazy like, stories from yeah. up there. It's ridiculous. And that, I mean, I have, I've never heard anything since. I yeah. never heard anything yeah. after that. But those, they were so loud. It was, I don't know how else to describe it, but they were perfect sleigh bell sounds. Just, yeah. I think yeah, this kind so. of illustra illustrates the, the biggest problem any of us who are facing if we want to be objective when we look at this stuff, mm -hmm. is if we look at Santa Claus manifestations or if we look at predator manifestations or Jeepers Creepers manifestations, then we have to start looking at a lot more. We have to start looking at gray extraterrestrial manifestations. Mm -hmm. What was the cultural contamination there? We have to start looking at ghostly apparition manifestations what's the cultural contamination there what if everything we see isn't what it it presents itself to us as or how we perceive it to be none of this might actually look like the way it presents itself to us yeah exactly yeah. well i mean that's yeah. uh, that's okay before i say this bernadette i don't know why but i just have this we i keep waiting for something to poke its head behind your your door there <laughs> Uh, it's like I just you I just kind of expect this something. thing to just poke. <laughs> well, that so, place she you actually might haunted. see something. You wouldn't be the first. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you wouldn't be the first person. I don't want to jinx. Uh, let me knock on some wood. I don't even know if this is actual wood. <laughs> it was a cheaply built home. Anyway, but yeah, this really because this is one of those things that you talk to you know, you know, you follow just about. They don't like this really bizarre stuff. Like when it's like, why is it I've got stories that are textbook abduction cases right textbook but or missing time but it's a bird man that's involved mm -hmm. or it's something that looks like an actual demon that's come through a wall right it's like you have all this phenomena and you you're just like look maybe the easier answer here is 
none of this is what it looks like. I mean, that's even, um, oh, I can't, the guy who wrote Communion. Uh, Whitley Strieber. Strieber. Yeah, Strieber. Whitley Strieber, yeah. I have a story I don't know if I can tell about him from his childhood. Um, but it's like, you start, yeah. You know, even he sort of admits, hey, this isn't what it really is. Like, it's not, it's presenting itself differently. Once you understand that, that these things may not be presenting themselves the way they are, then really a lot of the the breakdown isn't what it looks like, but it's what it does. And that's when you start seeing a lot of overlap and a lot of what we can, what we often break apart is, well, this is a cryptid and this is paranormal and this is ufological. And it's like, no, 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 it's all the same thing. It's doing the same thing. It just looks different. And so we, to Dean's point, we like to put them in a nice little, you know, shoe box over here. This one gets an Amazon box. This one gets something that I got from Christmas last year, you know, and so we think they're separate phenomena. But if you look at what they do, they all be, they, it all merges into one phenomena. But then we do see independent phenomena from, from that. Like you could put a lot of this in this, but then you can put a lot of this into this one. So you're like, okay, there's different phenomena. The problem is it's looking different. And mm. we're, we're so caught up on what things look like or what people report it to look like that we miss sort of the obvious, right? And is that not maybe ultimately the point? Is that we'd miss the obvious that it's all the same thing? I think so. I, I, I get what you're talking about. And we as human beings, we also like to uh, anthropomorphize everything, don't we? We have to oh, see yeah. everything in our own image. Look, we even put God in our own image, didn't we? <laughs> so the idea that we take this world and we try to make sense out of it by projecting what we know onto it, right? Mm -hmm. So if we were with Reverend Kirk out in the woods that day in the 1600s, we're technologically advanced. So immediately, the uh, light at the side of the hill was not a hill, it's a UFO, right? Yeah. That's the way our mind would work. And I agree with you 100%. If we are dealing with vibration, if we are dealing with frequency, if we are somehow dealing with living energy, then we have to make sense out of this in some way. Mm -hmm. And when we experience something like that, we want to project everything onto it because our brain naturally wants to pick up things that it recognizes. And isn't it kind of curious, too, that we don't have any pictures of these things, right? Or very scant few pictures of these kind of things. Maybe because, like you had said, that they're not physically in that shape before us. We're yeah. putting, you know, we're, we're projecting what, well, two things here. We're either projecting what we want it to look like or it's projecting into us what it wants it to look like. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, we, we do have a question I, from... Um, from mortal clown, which is interesting. And I think a lot of us have talked about this in the past. And um, what's the relationship between UFO activity, Bigfoot and other cryptids? I mean, I think it's all related to be, to be honest. No, I think, I think there's a very fine line myself. St I mean, Stan Gordon does, you know, a great sure. job at looking at that. Um, Joshua Cutchin does a great job at looking yes, at he that. Does. There's, mm -hmm. there's, um, there's a number of authors who are worth reading mortal clown. If you haven't, I mean, we can talk about it obviously a little bit, but it's certainly those parallels have been drawn pretty extensively by some of the, I think the better writers in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm right. I'm, I'm with Dean on that. Um, I think there's, there's way more overlap in, than we would like. I, I do still think, however, there are some physical cryptids that we consider to be natural, you know, natural animals. They're just relic populations. And I do, again, at part of the hypothesis, I do think there is a very, very small population of actual, what we would call Bigfoot. I want to separate Bigfoot from Sasquatch because I think it was Westerners that said, Oh, what we're calling Bigfoot must clearly be Sasquatch. It's just that the indigenous people didn't know what they were talking about because they were all caught up in their mystical stuff. I would, I want to separate those two thoughts. No, there, there is, there is a good reason to think that there is a natural species of bipedal hominid running around America. Very, very small population. I think probably even less than 5,000. They're small, they're highly mobile. But then we have this other phenomenon that I believe is really going out of its way to look like it. I think it's using the idea of Bigfoot to hide again, what to hide what it really is. So that people sort of miss the obvious because you wake up in a, in the forest, you know, you're in a tent, you open your tent up and there's this giant eight foot tall, dark figure with red glowing eyes. It's a Bigfoot, but you wake up in your bed in your home in the middle of downtown Dallas. And there's an eight foot tall, dark figure with red glowing eyes. It's a shadow person or it's a demon or it's whatever. 
<laughs> but as soon as you say, hey, I saw a Bigfoot, what is it everybody does? We have researchers who run down and we got to be in that area. We got to look at it all the time. We got to focus on it and think about it. We buy, okay, technically it's Chewbacca, but we buy, we buy stuffed toys of Bigfoot. We do drawings of Bigfoot. We, we give this, this stuff attention and it, and it seems to do two things. One, it wipes away the paranormal for the vast majority of people because there's a, it's, oh, it was just a Bigfoot. They're, a giant monkey thing that's what the average person is thinking so they don't think paranormal so it just wipes away and covers its actual tracks the other thing is my question what is the where is the line between research interest and worship where hmm. is that line i don't know i don't know that that line's as hard and fast as we'd like to think it is yeah. there may be that may be a much fine there may not be a line like I'm even assuming that there is a line on this topic on that concept, but what if there isn't? What if, or that line's very, very thin, and it's very hard to see when you cross over. To burn its point, what if the reason for the appearance of a Bigfoot, or of a pterosaur, in my case, or of on and on and on, is to bring in the attention and what we think is interest and in research to them? is worship and that means power and authority and energy to them that's i mean that's the question i just i don't have answered yet and i don't know that we will ever have an answer until we get the spookatron 5000 patent pending <laughs> uh, well, I, think, I think maybe oh sorry no you no you go burn, you go you go burn it in. Well, I think maybe not only worship, but also if you have the fear, like I was a child seeing most of these things and some of them mm -hmm. I was terrified of. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're, they're getting some kind of, they're feeding off of it so they can just go on their merry way for another mm -hmm. 50 years or another 100 years before they pop up doing something else, you know? Oh, honestly, that was, this happened a couple of years ago for me. I, I mean, I say couple, but I think nine, 1990 was 10 years ago too. Um, <laughs> I sort of had this weird realization one day and it started to really cheese my cracker. What if, okay, getting a real far field, but what if Monsters Incorporated is a documentary? <laughs> right? I mean, not as, a, you know, not as a literal documentary, but you know, obviously in the occult world, you, you have to tell people what you're doing. What if that's what this is? What if that's really literally what Monsters Incorporated was? This sort of veiled admission of what they do, of how they operate, what their goals are. I mean, nearly every person I've dealt with, that I've, that I've uh, helped with, with shadow people as an adult, they all have trauma that traces all the way back to their childhood, every single one of them. What if, to your point, this is that's they 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 feed off of that trauma and that pain? Again, what if Monsters Incorporated is basically just a? You know what? You're not the first person I've heard reference that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I am the best looking one, but it, yeah, I know, I, I get it. Um, you know, like the monster coming out of the closet, and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean the the big all seeing eye in the middle of the of the M that's yeah. shaped like a pyramid. It's like you, once you kind of see it, you're like, "Holy crap!" Like they weren't being subtle at all with this stuff. It's like it's almost so obvious. You're like, "Oh, that can't be a thing, right?" But what if it kind of is? What if that's sort of the point? Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder. I wonder too to the point of the question regarding whether Bigfoot and UFOs are related or how they're related. I often think we tend to group things in the paranormal in the, the wrong way. Not only like I'm saying, well, it might be all one phenomena and this might all just be different manifestations, but take the UFO phenomenon, for example. A lot of UFO believers will happily put the the, the crop circle in the same grouping as the weird ghost light. <laughs> <laughs> Best even picture how... of Dean I've ever seen. Yeah, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm handsome. Um, I, yeah, so a lot of UFO <laughs> believers will put the the 
the crop circle in the same box as the light at the end of the field. It's the same box mm -hmm. as the Tic Tac video. It's the same box at the light and the you know distant sky in the same box as the gray extraterrestrial at the end of the bed. But all of those things might be different phenomena. They might have nothing to do with each other. The, the crop yeah. circle might be a hoaxer. The light at the end of my back 40 might actually be swamp gas. The light in the sky, which is chasing you at night, might just actually be Venus. The thing at the end of your bed might be some paranormal manifestation and the Tic Tac video might be some government top secret project, whether it's disinfo or they're testing some type of craft to see how Navy pilots respond. So all of these things might be very different. So I think we're in this weird place of how do we categorize? So maybe Bigfoot and gray extraterrestrials and Virgin Mary, maybe they're all the same phenomena, but maybe the Tic Tac video has nothing to do with the gray extraterrestrial at the end of your bed. Well, you know, unfortunately, you know, in, in my case, I've got to, you know, I'm writing this stuff and, and getting these reports every day. And if you start theorizing on things, that's when you start getting pushback. People want things put in categories. Yep. You know, and it, it is unfortunate. Now, that's why I, I venture into doing a book occasionally because I can put my thoughts in there once in a while. But as far as writing the blog, people, I, I get a lot of pushback when I start doing that. Now, you know, oh, you know, I, it, it, you know, do, 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 is it that people really do want to see these things put in categories or are they open enough to, um, you know, to think that there's some relation between this phenomenon? Well, but there's, there's comfort in the box, right? Yeah. I mean, that's just really what it is. Like once you can, I mean, as humans, we're like, okay, that's a horse. I know how horses operate. I know how to behave around a horse. I'm good. That's a dog. I know. But it's like, if we didn't know if we were dealing with a dog or a horse, it would cause us a lot of stress because you don't treat a dog the way you treat a horse. You certainly don't treat a dog the way you treat a bear. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I can see, you know, people want things to fit in a box because that makes them more comfortable mm -hmm. for the majority of people. The box that says it's all fiction is more comfortable. Right. So that's why it's just, it's easier for them. I've had people tell me, I don't want to know if this is real because then they have to deal with it. And that, and, the, and they would rather just say, that's all fiction. And then most people just run across it. And again, I, I believe the pterosaurs were real and that they were still alive. I just didn't think they were in Dallas, <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's, it, yeah. you know, but sometimes you run across something you're like, okay, so reality just smacks you in the face. Like, you know, some angry seal. And you're like, well, I gotta do, mm -hmm. I gotta do something with that. Yeah. I'll tell you another group of people that like to put things in the box. Uh, not only is it the scientific world, but the paranormal folk do as well, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because then they can become experts of a particular box. Yep. Or they could have, you know, I know how to deal with this box. Nobody else does. And yep. that makes it even, the, the water's even more muddied whenever that happens. Oh, yeah. No, no, absolutely. I mean, we're all in our own little boxes. Again, I, that's one of the reasons we do the things we do on our channel is we wanted to bring everyone together because we're like, you know, why not? Like, we, all this is based on presupposition. Every, mm. So much of what we're doing is based on presupposition. Um, and oh, that's, I hate that word right there, expert. Right? But you know what? You yeah. hear it being bandied about more and more. I'm mm -hmm. surprised because about a decade ago, nobody used that word. Yeah. Now, especially the talking heads on, on television, oh, you, know, yeah. you do have these experts because, you know, they, they look good. They dress like rock stars and uh, people assume that they know what they're talking about. Yeah. You know, I do a lot of conferences and, and the majority of the people that I've spoken with who are supposed to be the experts in that field have very little working knowledge of the field itself. You know, they can talk to you about particular cases, but whatever you get right down, like they could never have a conversation like we had tonight. It just doesn't fit into their scheme. You know, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I really think that there's more. That's why I'm so grateful for shows like Lawn Puts On and like you gentlemen put on. It's because we have an open forum. Uh, this might not be everybody's cup of tea, but it is indeed a cup of tea that we need to drink if we're going to find out what the answer to all this stuff is. Yeah, and I appreciate you signing up for my OnlyFans channel. Absolutely. <laughs> I look forward to Thursdays. As do I. As do I. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? You're not going to get a conversation like this at a conference. <laughs> That's, so, right. You know. That's right. That's right. You know, yeah. you know, I, I, so. I attended um, uh, the Dogman Conference uh, down in Paris, Tennessee um, in, um, in August. 
and it was very open. It was one of the best conferences I've ever attended because I've heard you, a lot of good things about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because usually that's a great picture, right? That looks like a prison lineup. Uh, but yeah. whenever, <laughs> uh, whenever we, uh, whenever you go to most conferences, it is so um, regimented. You know, it's it's these people are talking about this, and you really can't have any kind of gray areas because apparently the public doesn't like gray area, but I really like gray areas. Well, I'm turning gray, so it's all good. Um, <laughs> but okay, you you uh, since we're not going to get to Alti. Um, let me okay. Let me push a bunch of buttons all at once. <clears throat> the reason for the boxes is because paranormal, Bigfoot, UFO, Alti, whatever. <laughs> for most people, the reason they like the boxes, the reason they don't want the con the conflicts, is because that's their that's become their religion. It's mm -hmm. replaced religion in their lives. And so when you, I mean, okay, I love conferences. I'm going to Jefferson. Come visit us in Jefferson. You can poke me with the stick. You got to pay me 10 bucks to do it, but I'll, I'll let you poke me with the stick carefully. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is people, they, what do they do? They go and they tell you their encounters and their stories, and you have to validate them and tell them that they're right and that their understanding and perception is right, or they become terribly offended. Why? It's the same thing when you go to church Again, I'm a religious person. I, I call myself a biblical paranormal researcher for a reason. But they give their testimony, right? Yeah. Their encounter with God, how they turn to the faith. It's the exact same thing. I was literally at a conference, I won't name drop again, talking to someone when they were doing uh, sort of the beginning research of the uh, Sasquatch Alba Vernix, right? There was a window that supposedly a Sasquatch had put its face on. We had skin mm -hmm. oils there. And we were waiting to go into it like we were just waiting i was going to wait for the line to go down but it's like we were waiting to go see this piece of glass now again i'm going to say look scientific interest i would like to see it i'd like to see if the sad squatch alba vernix turns into something uh again measurable observable i love science at the same time i couldn't help but notice what's the difference between what we're doing and someone going to turin to see the shroud of jesus mm -hmm. There's zero difference there. Uh, fundamentally, we can dress it up as I like science. I want to understand the truth. Well, guess what? Religion is the search for truth, too. So mm -hmm. that's why, I mean, with all this, why do you know why do we put things in boxes? Because that's their religion now. And so for them, their validation, their identity is tied up in chewy. chewy well, again, I spend a lot of time in the nerd world, world, obviously. But it's the same thing for Star Wars or Star Trek. It's the same thing for all of, you know, for all these things. There are people who've committed suicide because Battlestar Galactica went off air. Like yep. that's, that's a religion. It becomes their identity after a while. Mm -hmm. uh, not only their identity, but it also becomes their tribe. If you want to think about this yes. on a very basic sociological oh, yeah. platform. And, and there's something to be said that if you disrupt that tradition of the tribe, mm -hmm. uh, things don't go very smoothly. You know, you're. I'm gonna have to watch you more and more, my friend. Again, Thursdays, it's it, <laughs> it's glistening Scotsman. Not only fans, uh -huh. hundred dollars a month. I think, I think you're right. I think you're right, Jason, about there being that religiosity, and I think Ronald's right about there being the mm -hmm. tribalism. I think a lot of it has to do again with people not listening to Charles Ford. The reason it stays in these boxes is because they're approaching it like they're they're their own science. So they want yeah. cryptozoology or Bigfootology or whatever to be accepted. So they 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 hit it at a zoological level, thinking science mm -hmm. will open the doors when they get that when they get that hair sample or when they mm -hmm. get that body or whatever. Ufology approach it more often than not again as a scientific endeavor because they think well if we can prove it somehow you know that that aspect of the sciences will open the door mm -hmm. even people who are in the more paranormal aspects ghost hunting for example or you know psi research or something think yeah. that they can they they can somehow bang on the doors of science long enough and they'll open and then they'll be bought in but again we've been taught by both Kuhn and by Fort before him that's not the way science works it doesn't work by outsiders banging on the doors and them opening eventually so yeah. it's a fool's errand but it's definitely that almost worshipful attitude to science which extends outside of the scientific establishment into mm -hmm. these Fortian sciences that we're talking about well it's like i said at the beginning the, the, the fight is not between science and religion it's between religion and religion it, it people are like, oh science religion don't go together no, no no science is just a tool it is the process that's all it is and it's only one way of knowing by the way we limited science to just 
laboratory science. It, there's other ways of knowing, whole other conversation. But it's really, again, there's a, what is prominent now, what is useful to the politicians and the elite today mm-hmm. is a very materialistic, naturalistic, Darwinian, atheistic perspective. And that's the religious viewpoint that gets all the money. That's the religious viewpoint that is propagated in our schools and in our colleges, which is why this stuff won't be let in. But the problem is, mm-hmm. and this goes back to a conversation I had a while ago on Genesis 1. It's like, well, would we do a better job today of describing the creation of the universe today? And I would argue maybe we wouldn't. What if it's so far beyond our understanding that just because we think I've, you know, it's like I've got a cell phone and we've got lasers and we know about Star Trek and I can throw all these Star, you know, these these Star Trek terms on a phenomena that makes my description any better than someone 3,000 years ago. What if another 3,000 years people would look at my description, description and say, you're just a Neanderthal. <laughs> Energy, lasers. What kind of crap is that? Right? It's and so, you know, to the point, it's this is ultimately a religious fight. And what we have are different denominations and different religions battling it out. And maybe that's the bigger problem. Well, folks, I am so glad I had you all on tonight. This was an interesting conversation. Uh kind of went a little here and there, but it, it was interesting. <laughs> uh, no, no Cadborosaurus. So <laughs> well, I'd I, I listen to it. Well, what do you want to say, uh, Jason? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> he produces the best eggs every Produce, Easter. Uh, Cadbury, no, okay. Oh, okay, I get it now. Okay, two questions. No, no, it is actually, I swear <laughs> it's my favorite cryptid of all time, is the Cadborosaurus. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's the only one technically officially recognized by science. We know it from one skeleton that was caught in, in Cadboro Bay. But the thing is, you look at the descriptions of it, right? One set of front flippers, sort of uh, a, a horse-like head, fluked tail. It looks very, very similar to the descriptions you get of Alti from the Altamahata River, mm-hmm. right? The Altamahata. I I think that there is now again, I don't think they're I don't think they're actually reptilian. I think they're probably mammalian, right? They could be some form of Zulodon or or uh, you know, maybe another cetacean, but of all the cryptids in the world, this is my favorite. I know I saw a pterosaur. I'm just saying this one's my favorite because I think there's a really good chance of this being a very natural existent creature, possibly even the origin for the sea serpent. And because of the consistency of description between Canada, right, the Canadian stuff and the and the Atlantic stuff, it makes me think there's two different, you know, again, two different groups, prop, probably even two different subspecies of the same species. But there's enough familiar, you know, enough, again, sort of like, a lot of this stuff, there's so much uh, similar description of their behavior and of their appearance in two completely unrelated areas. They go back far enough. There's got to be something there. That's it. Plus, again, the eggs, the egg thing. <laughs> buck, 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 buck. Well, guys, thanks for coming on tonight. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask each of you to uh, tell the folks how they can get in contact with you, your books and appearances and just let it loose tell them what you want to hear uh jason start with you oh of course you'll start with me okay most recent book i'm on amazon you can find me but go to uh texas front porch tex apostrophe s front porch any show has got all the doobly-doos on there um siru papers.com sru papers and of course you can find me and the lovely dean bertram every tuesday on mysterious library on the untold radio am channel and then the rest of the week it's Texas Front Porch and Sierra. Go ahead, Dean. Well, yes, please come and check out Jason and I next Tuesday on untoldradioam.com. I also have another show on that channel now. Lon was a guest on it some time ago before we moved to Doug Hychek's Untold Radio Network. But the other show is called Mysterious Library, which I co-host with my partner and weird and girlfriend Jen Durrell. And that's yep. every I'll get to that in a minute, Jason. That's um that's every Saturday night at 10 p.m. Central on untoldradioam.com and you can see it on YouTube or on Facebook. But this week, Jen's at a paranormal investigation come conference. So Jason Hewlett, not Jason, yeah, sorry, Jason Hewlett, Jason McLean. I had Jason yeah. Hewlett on last week. On oh, the show. That hurts <laughs> yeah. you. Jason, Jason McLean, my co-host from my from Mysterious Library, is jumping on to co-host Talking Weird, which is going to be a bunch of fun. So, yeah, go and check us out on untoldradioam.com. 
and well, Mr. Murphy. I, again, you can catch anything that I do on uh, on uh, uh, Amazon.com. I'm not very good with self promotion. Uh, I'm in uh, 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 the Ridge Sasquatch uh, on uh, covered uh, on uh, Small Town Monsters. It's on YouTube right now, and uh, we are exploring the the Chestnut Ridge, as a matter of fact. Uh, in these uh, opening episodes, so that's there. And I'm looking forward to next year's conferences. So if anybody's booking, uh, you can reach me at Ronald L. Murphy Jr. at yahoo.com. That's my email address. Now get to me directly. And that's I'm pr I'm pretty low tech and old fashioned whenever it comes to this kind of stuff. So, uh, but yeah, that, that that's it in a nutshell. And gentlemen, I would love to be on your shows as well as as well, and of course being on your show again as well too. But I appreciate that uh, you have me on here. I'm quite flattered. Yeah, we'll have to get you on sometime. Ron. I'm looking forward to it. Well, I hope to have you all back on again. So uh, thanks again. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll be talking soon. Hey, thank, thank you very much, Mwah. guys. Mwah. Mwah. Bye, guys. <laughs> now, if uh, you have a sighting or encounter report that you would like to consider for our personal reports or uh, you know, personal, even Fams of Monsters, uh, feel free to forward your email to lawnstricker at famsofmonsters.com. And if, uh, you know, if you have an unexplained encounter, something, feel free to contact me. Um, I want to again thank my guests for joining me this evening. Very interesting conversation. It was great to have them all on. And thanks to each and all of you for watching and chatting. There was quite a conversation going on in the chat tonight. That's what we like. So, uh, you know, please like, subscribe, share, and also comment. Uh, we, we like your comments. So next Wednesday, there will be another episode of Fams of Monsters Personal Reports, and that'll be at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Uh, we got some real doozies this time. And next Friday, I will have a couple joining me who are Dogman Experiencers from Ohio. Uh, they will be talking about their 12-year ordeal with the monsters in their backyard. So uh, it should be quite interesting. So until next week, stay healthy and have a safe, enjoyable weekend. Good night.